My name is Ann Pyburn, um, and I'm a professor of anthropology at Indiana University. Um, I'm not. I'm a facilitator, um, a, a bridge, a conduit <laughs> between um, the Eye Pinch Project and um, a number of stakeholders, um, interested parties in uh, Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. I've been working in Kyrgyzstan now for about about eight years, and the Eye Pinch Project is the final of, I guess, three projects that I've um, managed to find funding for um, to um, um, talk to people about heritage and to find out if there was anything that I could do to help people um, decide what they wanted to do with their heritage, uh, how they wanted to define their heritage in a newly globalizing context of Kyrgyzstan, um, and to figure out um, um, uh, ways to realize their interests. Um, and Aida um, is one of the primary people um, um, who um, uh, has worked with me and whom I have worked with. <laughs> uh, I'm Aida Abdukhanova. I'm archaeologist from Kyrgyzstan uh, and uh, I, I also one of the implementers of uh, iPinch project in Kyrgyzstan thanks to the professor in Pyburn. And I can say that uh, cultural heritage studies in the territory of Kyrgyzstan is only in the beginning stage. Yeah, and uh, it needs further development and also so doing uh, there. And um, visiting of professor, visiting professor of Anne Pyburn to Kyrgyzstan and uh, her activities there and her teaching uh, and uh, research activity, I can say, uh, it was very helpful for me personally. And I, I, I know that for other people also, not only for the archaeologists, but uh, for the local people and as different stakeholders, as she told before. Uh, now I can say that uh, we, we now acquainted with the Western principles of cultural heritage protection and preservation of the sites and also uh, further uh, thinking about the future of the sites. And it was uh, uh, done uh, within these projects, or iPinch projects, uh, last two years uh, and I can say that uh, most of them they were very successful because uh, we have a very positive experience of uh, talking and communicating with the local people and with uh, not only local people but also the representative of the local governmental bodies yeah, so touristic agencies and any interested person now we are thinking about the heritage as a living heritage we try to attract the uh, attention of the people to, to care of them because they are part of their life and also it will be part of their future. Um, and for me personally, it's, it's very... I, I can say that I'm, I was growing, yeah? I, I'm still growing in this uh, uh, case, this scale, and I hope... Uh, um, uh, how to say? <laughs> I hope it's very useful for development of archaeology and cultural heritage studies in Kyrgyzstan. When I, I first met um, people in Kyrgyzstan, um, the things that I learned from the people that I met, and, and I always have to qualify this and say that I can, I'm only speaking in terms of the small number of people that I, that I know and that I have met of, in a limited experience. Um, and as Larry Zimmerman is fond of reminding me, I don't speak Russian or Kyrgyz, so I can only tell you what I think is going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as I said earlier, um, people are not thinking about their heritage as property. Um, the first time I asked people in the Indiana conference um, how they would feel if the, the emblem of the Kyrgyz flag, which is a a symbol of the top of a yurt. It's kind of cross hatch in a circle. When you open the top of the yurt, the sun, just let the sun in or the smoke out, 
um, you can see the sky. So it has, a, at least to some extent, a, a, it's Im, it symbolizes freedom, I think, on, on the flag. And I'm trying to explain the idea of cultural heritage and cultural, cultural property and intellectual property. I said, okay, what if that emblem was used by um, the Turkish government to sell a soft drink? What if you started seeing that on, on bottles of um, a Turkish drink or Turkish wine as their emblem? And they, people looked at me like I was nuts, <laughs> which is probably true. But at, at, after, then we went on and talked about something else. And in a few minutes, there was a silence and people were sort of mumbling. And then somebody looked at me and said, could we go back and talk about that cultural property again? I, 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 let's, we know, I'd like to know more about that. Um, and that, that's kind of generally was my experience was that People, it hadn't occurred to people to think about heritage and culture as property. And that's a, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that it's property. But on the other hand, um, from looking at other parts of the world, um, it concerns me that people are not prepared for other people to treat their heritage as property. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's what I wanted to talk to people about, to give people a chance to make their own decisions about these issues before other organizations came in and made those decisions for Kyrgyz people like UNESCO or, or, or like the, the Kyrgyz government, which um, for at one point was making a tremendous emphasis that Kyrgyz heritage is, is the authentic heritage of nomads, only nomads, and that only that heritage is authentically Kyrgyz. And this is happening right alongside um, some real political violence between people who speak Kyrgyz and people who speak Uzbek, but who live within Kyrgyzstan. The, the archaeological heritage of Kyrgyzstan is fabulously complicated, and it's, in fact, just downright fabulous. There is no kind of archaeology that Kyrgyzstan does not have, all the way from hominids. <laughs> right. <laughs> from the Stone Age. To all, the... all the way to the medieval cities and everything in between. This was, there were many silk roads and many of them went through what is today Kyrgyzstan. So the idea that Kyrgyzstan's heritage is one kind of culture and one kind of language is such an, um, an impoverished way to understand this incredible diversity and richness of the Kyrgyz past. And, and of course, you know, frankly, this is not not really any of my business, but I can't help but myself be really inspired by the fact that Kyrgyzstan has always been uh, a location of incredible diversity and yes, sometimes conflict and war and migration and all other complicated historical events. And yet, at the same time, that diversity and, 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 and mixing and creolization and resistance and domination has resulted in an unbelievably rich um, history and past and culture that I think um, in terms of something to share with the world, to me that's infinitely more exciting and inspiring than we, we are nomads, which by the way, apparently the Kazakhs also claim that. <laughs> their <laughs> heritage. <so. laughs> but um, okay, so tell me. And so now that I've had way too much to say about your heritage, tell me what. <laughs> tell me what's really going on. <laughs> I'm totally agree with you. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> no. it's really, really rich, um, uh, great past of the, uh, especially uh, in case of archaeological heritage. I mean. And yes, the idea of uh, well, only one people uh, uh, in, inherited all this uh, heritage is not right, is not correct uh, in, uh, from the roots, yeah. Uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, recent uh, political um, uh, so oppositions between uh, nationalism, between Uzbek, Kyrgyz people and other people, even with Tajik people, they have borders. They are uh, more a political issue, not not historical, because after 2010, when we have a very great violent scenes on the south, uh, 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 we uh, I'm 
we with my friend we make some small survey research survey of the historical past and archaeological past and write a paper uh, wrote a paper do, uh, which was named uh, and titled as uh, uh, Central Asia in the Past Dialogue and or Confrontation and finally we revealed our outcomes was uh, were the uh, historically Central Asian people always uh, agreed with each other they have some models of the behavior and uh, uh, that models they were how to say they were conducted in a very peaceful way mm. uh, and uh, we can talk uh, and we can talk about historical uh, regionalism of the region of the Central Asian region but now it's not region politically it's not region ha. but geographically historical we can say yes it's Central Asian countries it's Central Asian region but anyway politically all polit uh, politologists uh, who communicate with me they, they declared me that there's no region no economic uh, 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 regionalization no integrity right. no politics no just maybe cultural but culture is a product of the past uh, right. uh, events and uh, now we can say that uh, uh, it's also was inherited I mean the recent situation it was inherited from the Soviet past uh, or Soviet uh, period of the history of people when uh, people was divided into the territories and uh, they uh, now they, they became uh, t title nations, kind of first nations, yeah. And it, I think it was made artificially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, uh, the last, well, th this September, I already told Anne, it was a, a game, uh, a great game, like Olympic game, but not, it's very small scale, but it was nomadic game. And all Central Asian countries they were participated in this game. A lot of people came, and I was very uh, astonished that our government fully supported this idea and uh, implemented this very successfully. And I understood that, uh, despite of the any different political uh, things, which uh, disintegrate us, yeah, and uh, the idea of uh, cultural identity and historical uh, identity. It's very strong uh, because uh, even ordinary people support this idea, and it was kind of great festival. Yeah. It's, uh, it takes, I think, one week. So it was one week, and a lot of people they were they won some uh, prizes, and uh, they always we can uh, watch watch, uh, watch this event on the TV. And it was also not kind of game, but also it's kind of theater. Mm -hmm. uh, they created mm -hmm. this big camp with a nomad uh, style of life and mm -hmm. the people, actors, they were living there. They were living there and show the scenes from the ancient, from the past. And it was very, it was common for all nomad people of the Central Asian region, including Mongolia and other Siberian people, for example. A lot of people came. Mm -hmm. And I understood that past is living. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, in the future. Yeah, yeah. We, will, we will remember about ours. And I think archaeological heritage also unites us. I think to be Kyrgyz, we need to, uh, to be open for any influence. Because you know that uh, this post-Soviet country is very influenced by the Russia and Chinese. China is very also very close to the, our borders. And uh, now we are only one country. I think it's very unique in one country, among Central Asian countries, we are follow the democratic way, but of course it's about democracy, but anyway, we are uh, different. We are different and we try to find our own way. And I think to be Kyrgyz, we need to be open and to absorb any ideas and just try to do uh, uh, not so, not wrong things in this case. Of course, it's uh, also uh, related with our mentality, with, uh, with our culture and our heritage. We speak from from different perspectives in several ways, and an another way that we speak differently is um, in terms of our age. It's a youthful, <laughs> exuberant. Um, looking um, for the future. <laughs> <laughs> idealistic. It's so it's so um, uh, it's so empowering and 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 so energizing for me to work with you. For 
from my perspective, <clears throat> what is becoming more important to me is something that I learned from reading um, um, uh, who, who articulated it and it took me a really a long time to actually learn the truth of what he was saying. It's a moral philosopher. Um, he calls himself a, a radical empiricist, but he's a kind of a phenomenologist named Michael Jackson. He's in religious studies at Harvard, but he was at IU for a while and he's actually a friend of mine. And he says in one of his recent publications that that old saying that Margaret Mead, uh, I used to, you know, promote this saying that never never doubt that a few people can change the world it's the only thing that ever has I always thought that was great and inspiring and then I read what Michael Jackson had to say about it which is that there is no extremist terrorist group who doesn't agree with that <laughs> but if you're willing to do anything you can change the world but you can't control what happens you can't control the results and the, the people who have done anything to change the world didn't get what they expected they didn't get what they wanted and if you think about the great despots or the terrorist organizations that do terrible things to get what they want it doesn't work and even people with good intentions so it hurt my feelings to try to understand that and to get and to come to believe it but now I do and I think what's crucial for me is to try to think about doing good on a human scale to try to think about doing something that helps, that's right, at a scale where I can see the result and have some understanding of my impact and therefore take some responsibility for it. So one of the most important things that has happened for me during the Kyrgyz project um, was that one of the main members of the project was a new spec speaker and that during the most recent violence that was taking place where he lives in the south of Kyrgyzstan um, and people who speak Kyrgyz in that area and, this, and uh, I don't know, over a hundred people were killed but during that whole process most of the members of the, of the project who were Kyrgyz speakers all knew where he was and how he was doing and that he was okay and to me that, that's, that's really cool they didn't know each other before that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd like to say something about money. Oh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> because where else would we have been able to get support to help make posters for fourth graders in Kachkor? Where else would we have been able to get um, the money to um, bring Aida to come and, and, and talk to me and to experience this and share herself um, to make the connections among um, people who have important things to share um, but there is the world doesn't support this kind of you know Funding organizations want a specific outcome by a specific date, and that was something that was discussed earlier today. And I managed to get support to, to help us figure out some projects that needed to be done, some small grassroots projects, but where else could we have gotten the support to do those? So and thanks. <laughs> thanks, yeah. George. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, all. <laughs>